Hi, I'm Rod Reuven David Bryant. I am really uh, happy to be able to lead this class and teach it each week or each time that you take it. And some of you may be doing them as a, what do you call a marathon watching of the classes. I hope that they are uh, educational and, and give you some information without boring you too much. And we're going to be uh, tackling another lecture. It's actually a part two. Its last class was deriving the laws. This is deriving the laws too, and we're going to be having a discussion, a further discussion on these issues. Uh, first, let me say, uh, anyone that can watch these videos or that you can encourage to watch all the videos, whether they be a Jewish, uh, a rabbi, or a pious non-Jew, we'd encourage them to watch the, these uh, lectures. And the reason why it's a definitive approach to bringing the best information so far out. The scholarship and the literature is very important and has been done quite well. And if you want to properly understand what a Noahide is and what the seven laws of Noah are, this is a great start. And it's a lot more in-depth than just saying seven and go to heaven. There's more to it. And one could literally spend a lifetime studying these laws and the levels of connection that they have with numerous number amount of 613 laws. So very important. One could dive into this and it will transform your life. It'll increase your knowledge and make you very excited about being a righteous non-Jew or even a knowledgeable Jew that can help the nations, the goyim, come to the knowledge of Hashem. In the last lesson, we reviewed the rules and trends governing the derivation of the Noahide laws. We saw that the seven laws are actually seven categories of principles expressing God's will for all humanity. And we also saw that the Galanim scholars from the Middle East from about 589 to 1038 and the Rishonim compiled statements of the expanded Noahide laws in this lesson. We will continue with the derivation of Noahide laws and talk about the unique aspects of each of the se seven categories. First, let's discuss Rambam, Rabbi Moshe Bar Maimon. Until the modern era, the most sophisticated elaboration of the Noahide laws was found in Mishnah Torah, of, uh, which was written by Rabbi Moshe Bar Maimon, known also as Maimonides or Rambam. The Mishnah Torah is a far-reaching and detailed systemization of halakha. Although it is not uh, the definitive work in Torah law, such as that would be of Rabbi Yosef Karo Shulchan Arut, completed in 1555, it has exerted more influence on the codification of Torah law than any other work since the sealing of the Talmud. What sets Mishnah Torah apart from other codes is its scope. Torah scholars before and after Maimonides tend to limit their studies only to the practical mitzvahs or commandments. However, Mishnah Torah seeks to explain every law of the Torah, whether it applies nowadays or not. And I must repeat this, the Mishnah Torah talks about and seeks to explain every law of Torah, whether it applies to nowadays or not, and you'll understand this better later on. The Noahide observances, since they were not a practical subject of study for much of the Jewish history, were not given much attention by other authorities. However, Maimonides examines them in detail. His writings are the utmost importance for the study of the Noahide laws. However, three points must be kept in mind when studying Maimonides' writings. Number one, Maimonides' word is not the final word. What he writes, though, is the utmost importance for study and understanding. Number two, Maimonides writes in a vacuum. This means that he does not always indicate where and when a given idea is applied or if it is relevant. Also, Maimonides never indicates his sources. When studying his work, one must always determine his sources. If the given law applies today or if it's in the future, and if it applies to Israel or in the diaspora or both, 
It's not clear. Many of his writings regarding non-Jews and Noahides do not apply in our times. However, this is not always apparent from the text. Number three, Maimonides' writes on the Noahide on the Noahide laws are not found in any other place. I'm sorry, in any one place. Mostly it's found in chapters 9 and 10 of Halakos Alachim. Many are scattered amongst numerous other topics. Also, laws in one location often modify in another. So a student must know the complete picture to fully understand Maimonides' thought. Although Maimonides is the most important writer on the Noahide laws, his writings cannot be taken at face value. They require detailed analysis and explanation before they can be applied practically. Let's examine later authorities. Understandably, authorities after Maimonides remained focused on practical matters affecting the Jewish community in exile. Much of Maimonides' Noahide writings do not find their way into latter sources. The Shulchan Aruch is an example. It contains only scant references to Noahide issues. However, the Noahide laws are frequently discussed in the responsa. It's a book called the responsa. It means, or in Hebrew, it means questions and answers. This is a collection of questions to famous Pashkim, people who were deciders of Jewish law, and their responses. Since the exile, Jews around the world have sent most of their questions and most difficult inquiries on thought and practice to the Pashkim. Thankfully, the Pashkim wrote back and their responses were preserved for posterity. While the Code of Law are general guides to practice, the responsa literature illustrates actual case Torah law. Throughout Jewish history, many questions were asked to Pashkim about the Torah's expectations for non-Jews. After Maimonides' writings, the responsa literature is the most important collection of uh, resources for the study of Noahide laws. In summary, the Talmud explains the references and the derivation of the Noahide laws from the text of the Torah. It does not list all the laws, only some as examples. The Geonim, which compiles a list of the laws and their subdivisions. Maimonides elaborated upon the Noahide laws and how they fit into the larger scope of Torah law. His writings are foundational for any study of Noahide laws. The Pashka, later authorities, provide guidance and insight into the real-world application of the Noahide laws. The next subject in this lecture today is the importance of Torah study. If there's ever an important subject matter taught, this would be it today. Listen carefully. All of this may seem like a lot of work to come into an understanding of religious belief and practice. However, The effort involved is not unique to the Noahide laws. The derivation of Jewish law is also incredibly detailed, requiring scholarship and tremendous mental acuity. The question is asked, why do we need to put so much thought and effort into it? Or how about this? Why couldn't God just give us a list of laws and be done with it? A fundamental belief in Judaism and Noahidism is that God wants us to study the Torah deeply and exhaustively. By doing so, we engage directly with God's eternal will. The deeper we delve into the Torah, the more we connect with God and understand God. Remember, God wants us to engage with Him, and He wants to engage with us. If prayer is our speaking to God, then Torah study is God speaking to us. I would also add that Torah study is the ultimate act of worship for the Jew and the Noahide. Also, practically speaking, a mere list of rules can easily come to be ignored. However, something into which one has delved and invested his whole being becomes deeply ingrained. Ingrained study, studied material is neither easily ignored nor forgotten. Let's look at the seven Noahide categories. This lesson and the following will provide a brief overview of general concepts unique to each of the seven categories of Noahidism. The first one is Denim, 
the courts of justice, the requirement to exercise justice. Remember Dina, the daughter of Leah, whom she was born into Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, the prince of the land, saw her and he took her and lay with her. The two sons of Yaakov, Simeon and Levi, Dana's brothers, each took men with their own sword and came upon the city in the night unawares. They slew all the males. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain of the spoil of the city because they, they had defiled their sister. And Jacob sa said to Simeon and Levi, you have aggrieved me and made me hateful to the inhabitants of the land. Genesis 34. Monides explains that the entire city of Shechem was put to death for failing to bring Dina's assailants to justice. The entire city transgressed the mitzvah of Denim, justice, the requirement to exercise justice. Nachmanides, however, perceived a big problem with this interpretation. The Talmud teaches the, that Noahides are only liable for death penalty for transgressing a negative commandment meaning a prohibition, like thou shalt not. The failure of Shech is to try to allege perpetrators is the transgression of a positive thou shalt mitzvah. The commandment is established and is carry out justice. Since it is the transgression of the positive mitzvah, then why did Shechem de deserve death? The Mary uh, provides an insightful uh, answer from the Talmud itself. The Talmud uses the seven Noahide laws as listed as prohibitions, negative commandments. And the Talmud itself questions the idea, thought, though asked, if all the Noahide laws are prohibitions, then why is Denim included? Is not Denim the requirement to carry out justice? A positive commandment? The Talmud answers that the Noahide laws are merely listed according to their negative, prohibitive qualities. In truth, though the Noahide laws are not 100% prohibitive in nature, similarly, the Neem, the requirement to establish courts, is not purely positive commandment. It includes both positive and negative aspects. In one sense, it requires the establishment of courts and enforcement of laws, the positive aspects. It also prohibits perversion of justice and the allowance of crime to run rampant. Therefore, by not trying the crimes against Dina, Shech violated negative and positive aspects of Denim, justice, and for this, deserved death. Based on this understanding of Denim, we see that Denim includes laws pertaining to the establishment and operation of the legal system and prohibits the, to uh, prevent perversion and laxity. As a general rule, the seven Noahide laws, despite being termed as prohibitions, contain positive notes as well. By what standard do Noahide courts establish themselves, and create and try and enforce the laws? Shall they base their denim, their legal system, on their own logic? And needs of the time? Or perhaps should their laws be based on Torah law? Nachmanides holds that the Noahide legal system is based upon the same system outlined by the Torah for Jews. According to this option, the same laws govern loans or partnerships between Jews would apply to loans and partnerships between Noahides. If Nachmanides opinion is the rule, then today's secular courts are not fulfilling the mitzvah of a denim. Therefore, Noahides cannot sue in secular court and must use a, either a base din, a religious court of Jews, or convene a court of Noahides who are experts in their law. However, Maimonides disagrees with Nachmanides. I must say, there are no base dins of Noahides. Hopefully, in the near future, we will see that opportunity fulfilled. I said that uh, there was a disagreement. Maimonides states, quote, It de devolves upon the judges to create equitable rules, appropriate for each country, 
according to the ways in which the nations currently handle such matters. The law of the land is the law. The, the civil courts and the laws they establish fulfill the mitzvah of Denim for Noahides. According to Anatoly and Maimonides, it is not necessary for particular laws of Noahide courts to match the details of the Torah law as given to the Jews. Therefore, modern courts are 100% satisfying the requirements of Denim and is, is a mitzvah for Noahides to use them. The Rama explains these differences of opinion as having their source in the Talmud. Genesis 2.16 states, Lord God commanded man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you must surely eat. The Talmud, Sanhedrin 56b, explains that Rabbi Yohanan learns the name from the word Vayetzav, and he commanded, that word means and he commanded. Relating the use of the word here is to use it in, for example, Genesis eighteen nineteen. For I have known him that he will command his children and his household after them, that they will keep the ways of God, to do righteousness and justice. This verse is pertaining to Abraham's household and their observances of God's law. Since no complete code of civil law had yet been given at the time of Abraham, then this verse must be referring to any logically derived system of civil law. Therefore, Denim is satisfied by the establishment of any logically derived, well-regulated system of law. However, Rabbi Yitzhak derives the name from the word Elohim, God, from Genesis 2.16, which states, Lord God commanded, saying, Every tree of the garden you may surely eat. Rabbi Yitzhak relates the words used here to the word, uh, the use of the word Elohim in Exodus 22.7. The master of the house shall approach the judge. Now, in this verse, the word Elohim means judge, and implies a civil system of law. Elohim may have either meaning depending on the context, obviously. Since this verse is pertaining to laws after the given of the Torah, then it must be referring to an established legal system, the Torah legal system. By connecting the verses to the name in Exodus 2.16 to this verse, Exodus 22.7, Rabbi Yitzhak is telling us that Noahide courts must follow the civil laws set forth by the Torah. So, Nachmanides appears to hold like Rabbi Yochanan, and Maimonides' thought appears to hold like Rabbi Yitzhak. The discussion continues among later authorities. The Rama concludes like Rabbi Yochanan and the Maimonides, Certain aspects of civil law are fundamentally the same between Jewish and non-Jewish. It follows the Torah mandates. Many other later authorities take the same view. However, many of the formidable Pashtun, including like Maimonides, states follows this idea that the laws established by secular courts are sufficient for non-Jews, whose opinion is definitive. Well, as we know, three Jews, five different opinions. <laughs> the answer to this question requires more space than we have at this time and will be discussed in later lessons on civil and monetary laws. As we see, when you have one question posed, you have five different answers and maybe not all answers are equally the same or maybe agree with each other. But one of the ideas that we all learn when we come into Torah study, uh, when we see that the sages of blessed memory wrestle with the Torah, as Hashem designed it to be, they have to wrestle with these ideas. The Pashtun have to wrestle with ideas that many of us will find too difficult to answer. And yet in this wrestling and debating and discussing and even disagreement, there is a thread of truth that winds itself through it all. And this is what makes being a Noahide and a Jew so exciting, is that when you delve into the Torah and its mysteries, and its understandings, you begin to see image of Hashem that you could not see. We know God does not have a body, and He doesn't have an image. I'm reminded of this in closing, that Moses asked Hashem to show him His essence. He wanted to see Hashem. Hashem said, you can't. If you do, obviously, He would die. 
So he told him to turn his face to the cleft of the rock, and he passed Moshe. The very next words, God says, here is the Torah. What is it saying? The commentaries state that the essence of Hashem is in the Torah. If you want to see the master of the universe, if you want to understand the master of the universe, if you want to experience the majesty and the beauty of the king of the universe, it has to be done through the study of Torah. This concludes this lesson. Shalom.